Hello, my name is Frank Abel. Thank you for tuning in to PAC 14. I am here to tell you about an exciting event coming to Salisbury in November. Of course, I'm talking about the 10th Annual Shore Fraud Conference, which will be held on Friday, November the 21st in Bennett Auditorium in Purdue Hall on the campus of Salisbury University. The conference will be a day-long event beginning at 7 a.m. with continental breakfast and networking. The conference will conclude at 4.45 in the afternoon. We are offering eight hours of top quality NASBA approved continuing professional education at the very affordable cost of $135 per person. The conference is open to the public. Pre-registration is required and so I urge you to visit our website to get all of the details and to send in your registration without delay. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors, without whom this world-class conference would not be possible. The conference is sponsored by Delmarva Chapter 295 of the Institute of Management Accountants. The IMA is the leading worldwide association for accountants and financial professionals in business. Our sincere thanks to Chapter President Jesse Reed, Vice President Stephanie Valdivia, Treasurer Bill Perry, and the chapter members for their continuing support. Thanks also to the Accounting and Legal Studies Department of the Purdue School of Business. Dr. Ken Smith, Department Chair, and Ms. Beth Bloom have worked throughout the year to bring you this conference. Finally, our thanks to future business leaders from two student organizations at Salisbury University. These are the Iota Pi Chapter of Beta Alpha Psi Honor Society and the Salisbury University Chapter of the Institute of Management Accountants. Purdue Hall is located on the eastern edge of the campus, near the intersections of Route 13 and Bateman Street. The John Jay and Dolores Bennett Auditorium is located on the first floor of Purdue Hall. The lounge area and instructional areas will be utilized for networking, and we offer continuous refreshments throughout the day. Restrooms are conveniently located next to the auditorium. Conference activities in the auditorium will be streamed to high resolution, large screen monitors in the lounge and refreshment areas, to classrooms and to the executive boardrooms for the convenience of our attendees. More on that in just a moment. As I mentioned, this is the 10th year for the conference. When we began in 2005, our conference was attended by 70 accounting, business, education, and law enforcement professionals. Each year we have seen our numbers grow. In 2011, we moved into our new home in the state-of-the-art Purdue School of Business. Our attendance in 2013 exceeded 240 professionals from the Mid-Atlantic area. Members of nearly 100 organizations from Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Virginia, and the District of Columbia were represented at last year's conference. This offers an exceptional opportunity for networking, for making new friends, and for sharing experiences. We express our sincere thanks to the Delmarva IMA chapter. They have been working consistently throughout the year in order for the conference to receive once again this year certification by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy and to be listed on the National Registry of CPE Sponsors. No small accomplishment. Throughout the day you will have the opportunity to interact on a personal level with our speakers and with the conference attendees. The design of the auditorium, as well as our use of the adjoining lounge and refreshment areas, will promote a warm and friendly conference atmosphere, comfortable seating, and the Purdue School state-of-the-art audio and video capabilities will enhance your conference experience. We understand that some of our friends may prefer to view the conference from a location other than from the 215-seat auditorium. We fully understand that it is often not possible to leave the demands of the office behind for an entire day. With that in mind, we are excited to offer our attendees an alternative to viewing the conference in the auditorium. Our special thanks go out to the Dean of the Purdue School of Business, Dr. Christy Weir, for permitting us to utilize the two executive conference rooms. These luxury facilities will each seat 40 in very comfortable surroundings. The proceedings from the auditorium will be simulcast onto a 103-inch high-definition monitor. Free Wi-Fi will be available so that you may keep in touch with your office or with home. 
and we will be providing continuous refreshment service throughout the day. One might think of this as viewing the conference from a luxury skybox. Before I tell you about this year's conference, let me share with you an excerpt from last year's conference. Jerome Maine was found guilty of money laundering and mortgage fraud. As a result, he served a sentence in federal prison. Listen as he explains that experience. Just this morning, all across America, <coughs> hundreds of businessmen and women woke up, ate breakfast, got ready for work, but they're not at the office right now. In fact, they haven't been expected at the office in years because at exactly 8 a.m., they reported to the maintenance shed for groundskeeping duty or to the utility closet where they got a mop and a bucket. And today, they get to clean stairway number four. Some of the lucky businessmen and women, financial professionals, attorneys, some of the lucky ones get to use a small portion of their brain today and they get to teach drug dealers how to read. And tonight, they will go to bed on a thin plastic mattress where they will count the years, the months, the weeks, the days, the hours. I remember counting the minutes until I was released from federal prison. For two years, my name was federal inmate number 0865704 a name, uh, a number, I said or wrote down no less than 10 times a day. To my family and friends, of course I became the son, the brother, or the friend they thought they knew. To my former business partner, my business associates, my employees, I became the guy they couldn't be associated with anymore. Of course, right? Guilt by association is very real. <laughs> Thank God, to my kids, I've always been dad. Lucky for me, youth and innocence didn't judge. I have a story to tell, and I wish it was not my story. I wish I would have heard a story like this a long time ago, before I ever even had my first job. I wish I would have heard a story like this. I'd like to tell it now, because hopefully it will help some of you draw parallels to the things that you see every day. To some, hopefully it will help you make different decisions than you already make. And to some, hopefully, it will cause you to make different decisions than you ever would have made before. So I want to welcome you to this happy little session we have going on. <laughs> And then there's the reporting day, the impossible day, the day that you say goodbye to your wife or husband or kids, friends. It's impossible. It feels like, and I've never died before, but it feels like you're preparing to leave this earth the way you plan or don't plan certain things. You don't have an appointment next week. You know that. You know you won't be getting together for lunch with anyone. There isn't a future date that you have where preparing to go to prison, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, a, is amazing. It, it's mind game. It is how how do I know how much shampoo to buy? You know, I'm not going to buy a whole other bottle of shampoo. I mean, I'm leaving in a week, so I better get rather judicious about how much shampoo I use so I don't have to buy a new one. I mean, this, these thoughts were crazy. The, the day before I had to leave, I had, now I had been telling my kids all along that I was going to have to go away. I did something, and they knew what jail was. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to be going to jail. And I said two years. That's what I told them. I said, I'm going to be gone for two years. And you know, kids, when they're young like that, they don't always understand 
or can quantify years. Then you say, okay, uh, yeah, we went to the circus last year. It was last summer or two months ago. So I tried to put it in terms that they could understand. And the best thing I could come up with, I told them I was going to be gone for two Santa Claus. And they got it. You know kids. Kids take their cue from their parents or from adults. If you're not scared, that really helps. But they may not get scared. However, if you're scared, it doesn't even matter if something scary is going on or not. They're scared. I did my best to hold it together. But I just couldn't. I kept thinking about they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything wrong, but now they are paying the price for their father to do that. On November 4th, 1999, I reported to the federal prison in Yankton, South Dakota. Uh, white collar criminals aren't generally considered dangerous. So you're not escorted to the prison by the federal marshal. Uh, con air doesn't fly you in. <laughs> you have to find your own ride. <laughs> it's awkward asking your mom for a ride to prison. <laughs> but, but seriously, my mom and my, my girlfriend still with me. Pamela still with me. They gave me a, a ride and dropped me off. And it was the craziest feeling walking, walking up to the gates, walking in, turning around. It's not forever, but, but I can't leave. I I had been in therapy throughout the entire pretrial. This uh, isn't isn't that crazy, really, if you think about it. I was on several medications for anxiety and depression. Uh, now I didn't know if the prison was going to have my medication, so I showed up with two pockets full of pills. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, they frown on that. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect. I, don't, I didn't know anybody who would ever been to prison or, or jail. Um, I, I did not know what to expect. I mean, I, I was scared. I saw all the movies. Shawshank Redemption, Escape from them. I, I, I didn't know. But I, I'll put to, to rest one myth right now. Everybody thinks that when a guy goes to prison, there's always one thing that always <laughs> I just want you to know there is no big guy named Bob. Right? Uh, his name is Bradley. <laughs> now I would like to tell you about our program and our outstanding lineup of national presenters. Our keynote speaker for the conference is Bruce Dubinsky. Bruce is the chairman of the board of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. The ACFE is the world's largest anti-fraud organization and premier provider of anti-fraud training and education with nearly 70,000 members worldwide. In addition, Bruce is a managing director in the Global Disputes and Investigations Practice at Duff and Phelps. He is the city leader of the Washington, D.C. office and a co-chair of the Forensic Technology and Data Analytics Group. Bruce has been qualified and testified in court as an expert witness in more than 50 bench and jury trials. He has given deposition testimony in over 90 cases. Bruce is a nationally recognized expert in fraud investigations and forensic accounting, making frequent media and guest lecture appearances. Currently, Bruce is retained as the testifying expert witness for the Madoff Ponzi case. 
to provide forensic accounting analysis and to render certain expert opinions in the largest Ponzi scheme in the world's history. I am especially pleased that Bruce has accepted our invitation, and I encourage you to take a moment during the day to have a chat with Bruce. Our next speaker of the morning session is Martin Beagleman. Martin is currently a Director of Forensic Investigations at Deloitte Financial Advisory Services. His extensive experience includes work on behalf of corporate management and boards, FCPA and anti-bribery compliance, litigation consulting, due diligence, and corporate compliance design and implementation. He has conducted and managed hundreds of complex and high-risk international investigations in more than 70 countries, including China, India, Russia, and Brazil. Among his many accomplishments, Martin founded and led Microsoft Corporation's Financial Integrity Unit, a highly acclaimed global fraud prevention and anti-corruption compliance program. During his years of leadership as Director of Financial Integrity, he created a global coverage model with offices and staff in Redmond, Singapore, Beijing, Delhi, Moscow, Paris, Prague, and Dublin, while protecting Microsoft from financial and reputational risk. Martin's presentation is entitled, Cases and Lessons from a Life of Fighting Fraudsters. Our final speaker of the morning is Catherine Montemora. Kathy is the current Assistant Special Agent in Charge of the Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigation Division, Washington, D.C. Field Office. Kathy has the responsibility of overseeing planning operations, directions, and investigations in the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. She comes to the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area from IRS headquarters, where she was a senior analyst in the narcotics and counterterrorism section. As a senior analyst, she was responsible for providing policy, direction, and oversight to the narcotics and counterterrorism program. In addition, Kathy worked closely with the Executive Office of the Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement Task Force and was detailed to the Executive Office of the President, Office of National Drug Control Policy. Kathy will discuss a number of significant cases and investigations, which illustrates how the IRS ensures the integrity and fairness of the U.S. tax system. Over the years, our experience has been, to paraphrase a scene from the movie Field of Dreams, feed them and they will come. Well, this year is no exception. Our good friend, Mr. Tony Cerulli from University Dining Services, will once again be putting together a fantastic luncheon for us. Luncheon will be served in the Commons Dining Hall, just a short distance from Purdue Hall. We are offering an all-you-can-eat luncheon buffet with a seemingly endless variety of food choices. Many of our attendees choose a more traditional path by beginning with a salad bar and working their way towards the ample dessert options. It is not unheard of, however, for some of our friends to reverse the process. We leave that choice up to you. There are several dining areas in the Commons, and the Caroline Room is reserved solely for conference attendees. Remember, we are providing continental breakfast, refreshments throughout the day, and an afternoon snack, which includes ice cream and cake, to mark our 10th anniversary celebration. Our first speaker of the afternoon session is Paul Zickman. Paul is responsible for managing and conducting investigations of compliance matters, fraud and misconduct, implementing fraud detective techniques, administering the company's fraud and compliance risk assessment process, and managing anti-fraud compliance programs and controls designed to reduce the risk of fraud within the company. He possesses nearly 20 years of experience in this field and has effectively managed global fraud and forensic teams at various Fortune 500 companies. Paul, who is a certified fraud examiner, certified fraud deterrence specialist, and master analyst in financial forensics, has designed and implemented programs to detect and investigate instances of fraud. He also conducts fraud risk assessments and fraud awareness training to help detect and deter fraud within their organizations. His public and private sector experience includes the investigation of complex financial frauds, conducting forensic audit engagements, and providing litigation support for a variety of industries. 
Paul's presentation is entitled, Forensic Audit, Building a World-Class Program. Our final speaker of the afternoon session is Dr. Kelly Pope. Kelly is an associate professor in the School of Accountancy at DePaul University in Chicago. Her passion is white-collar crime. Dr. Pope is the founder of Helios Digital Learning, an education media company that offers a suite of educational, consulting, and training products and services designed to help organizations understand, identify, and prevent fraud. Helios develops e-cases, online courses, and documentaries that feature first-person perspectives from individuals who cross the line in various aspects of their professional careers. These stories chronicle personal and corporate pressures, pivotal events, and the individual's decision-making process in order to help learners to virtually simulate their own responses, thereby strengthening their decision-making framework and positioning them to make better, more ethical decisions. She interviews incarcerated white-collar criminals, the country's leading forensic accounting experts, accounting researchers, and business ethicists to develop real exposition of the impacts of those white lies that resulting in white-collar crimes serving federal prison sentences. Dr. Pope's presentation is entitled, All the Queen's Horses, the Rita Crunwell Story. This year, we have added a couple of new features. In addition to our lineup of outstanding presenters, we are pleased to introduce Kathy Lavender. Kathy is the Executive Director of Security and Investigative Placement Consultants. She has more than 15 years of recruiting experience that has focused on placing high-level security managers and investigative specialists in corporations, financial institutions, accounting firms, law firms, insurance companies, academic and healthcare institutions, nonprofits, and consulting firms. We are pleased to announce that Kathy will be available to meet with conference attendees individually for private consultations at no charge with no obligation. This will be an opportunity to meet with Kathy and to discuss issues of importance to you, such as how to promote yourself, tips in preparing a resume, preparing for that all-important job interview, figuring out what it takes to make it to the next step in your organization, or how to proceed when a career change is in your plans. We sincerely hope that you take advantage of this opportunity for a private consultation. As another bonus feature this year, we welcome Don Sparks, a Vice President at Automation Services. Don brings more than 30 years of experience in finding significant errors and fraud using data analysis software. He also served as Vice President for the Institute of Internal Auditors, where he was responsible for reviving the global auditing information network benchmarking services. IDEA is a powerful and user-friendly data analysis tool designed to help auditors, accountants, and other finance professionals perform data analysis quickly to help improve audits and identify control breakdowns. Don will be presenting hands-on two-hour sessions at no cost with no obligation, illustrating the capabilities of IDEA data analysis software. We will have a 30-seat computer lab with IDEA software operational. This will be an opportunity for you to get behind the wheel and test drive the latest in data analysis software. Before we close, I would like to share with you another excerpt from a presentation from last year's conference. Listen in as Dr. Ken Smith introduces our speaker. Well, I have the pleasure, again, I feel like the announcer at the main event here, never had this opportunity before. Uh, talk about our next speaker. Our next speaker has experienced identity theft in a very personal way. I'd like to share more about him, but that's all he'd tell me. <laughs> He's the award-winning author of Privacy Means, Pro Means Profit and has appeared on 60 Minutes, Fox Business, and Anderson Cooper. His clients include the Pentagon, Pfizer, Homeland Security, and his all-time favorite, the Shore Fraud Conference. <laughs> He's the founder of four successful startups, 
and the reason why two of them failed. <laughs> He's gone bankrupt, committed felonies, and stolen from his clients. We have much to learn from the identity of our next speaker. So in the immortal words of Arsenio Hall, let's give it up for Mr. John Cilio. summer morning in 2003 when I walked into my bank. It had rained all night long in Colorado, so it smelled like earth and mulch when I walked in and up to the window where Charlie worked. Charlie was this very southern, fiery woman who I had banked with since 1996. Let me give you a little bit of backstory. In 1996, I left management consulting in San Francisco, and I moved back to Denver, Colorado to take over my family's 30-year-old technology business. Probably all thinking, what was 30-year-old technology in 1996? <laughs> it's like this big old calculator watch. Now, in 1964, my dad started a TV repair shop out of his garage, and by the 1980s was installing microcomputers throughout the U.S. Micro, can you imagine what our macro computers look like? <laughs> well, I was raised in this environment, so even as a kid, I was an entrepreneur. I'm the, the one that ran the lemonade stands, right? And the, I mowed all the neighbors' lawns. Like a lot of kids, I flipped commercial real estate. <laughs> <laughs> You're eight CEs in, I'm just making sure you're still paying attention. <laughs> well, even in the late 90s, we could tell that software was going to be the next great wave of business. So I started up a software division of my family's company with my rock climbing partner, my good buddy, Doug. Doug and I took this expensive mainframe accounting package and we served it up for a few bucks a user over something new at the time, the internet. It was kind of like we were cloud computing. We were cloud computing, but it was still just slightly overcast computing or something. <laughs> Well, Doug and I grew to be pretty close. If you've ever been part of a startup, you spend a lot of hours, you spend a lot of time together. We became like brothers, the way he looked after me and mentored me. And he was a software genius, so we were making a lot of money in this little business pretty quickly. And I was in to see Charlie at the bank quite often, which means at this point, on that fateful day in 2003, I knew her pretty well. When I walked in that day, I just wanted to transfer some personal funds. This wasn't about business, this was about personal money. So I explained what I wanted to Charlie, and she looked back at me with those southern eyes and said, why, I'd be happy to help Mr. Cilio. <laughs> what do you think of my southern accent? <laughs> Obviously not much. It sounds remarkably like my French and Irish accent, which I'll use later. Well, she looked down at her computer, clicked away, looked back at me and said, I'd like to transfer your funds, Mr. Cilio, but I can't. Well, why not, Charlie? It says here, your account's completely empty. <laughs> Pause for a second to explain. Empty is not a subjective word. <laughs> if she'd said your funds are low or whatever, fine, but empty is so permanent, I knew there had to be a problem. And I was guessing it had to do with their computer system. Have you ever had one of those situations where you know somebody's making a mistake? Right? You know it in your soul, and as you point it out to them, you get a little full of yourself. A little uppity. Well, that's how I was. Charlie, it appears you have a glitch in your banking system. It's not really my problem, but if you'd like us to take a look at it, I'd be happy to. <laughs> oh, the arrogance. The lack of respect for the information, for what was going on. Mr. Cilio, it's not just saying your account's empty, it's telling me here to call security. Please wait right there. <laughs> I wanted to make a run for the getaway car before security got there, but that's not what happened. I am not proud of what happened next. 
It was one of those knee-jerk reactions that happens when you feel like somebody is feeding you a line of bull. Turn it. That's hogwash. <laughs> I had to come out a little stronger at the time. I had plenty of money in that account when I was in here last. Hogwash or not, Mr. Cilio, since you were in last, it says here, you bought a second home. You defaulted on your loan. You declared bankruptcy. And, oh my God, Mr. Cilio, it says right here, you had a sex change. <laughs> about an identity crisis. <laughs> she explained, my accounts indicated that I was a female living in Boca Raton, Florida, not Denver, Colorado. Now, I know it's easy to steal an identity, but a gender? <laughs> the first time my identity was stolen it was by a primary called a cashman. They dress up like your trash man, they drive around your neighborhood in a garbage truck, Pluck the bags off your curb, take them back to a warehouse where they filter through them for your numbers, your identity. A woman, Rosemary Serrano, purchased my stolen identity on the internet and used it to buy her very first home in Boca Raton, Florida. I affectionately refer to it as my second home, <laughs> which doesn't take a whole lot of maintenance on my part. When she could no longer make the payments, she defaulted on the loan. She declared bankruptcy in my name and left town to commit crimes as John Cilio. Suddenly, it was all my problem. Just for a second, put yourself in my shoes. Things are good. You're making good money. You're put in, in the bank like you're supposed to. You walk into that bank, and all of a sudden, sudden, everything you have worked for, everything, college for your kids, your retirement, is gone. You're being escorted out like I was physically by security guards. And to top it all off, somehow, you are now a woman. <laughs> With no money to go shopping. <laughs> How many times have you said the five most dangerous words in privacy, in security, maybe in fraud, having listened to Jerome? It won't happen to me. It won't happen to me. Rosemary Serrano. The first case. She showed me three things. She opened this window and she shed light on three different realities. Number one, part of who we are now, part of who we are is virtual. It's electronic. And just because it's digital doesn't mean it's worth any less or any less important than the physical. She told me, she taught me, she didn't tell me, I never met her. She taught me that that virtual self that we all have is constantly being spied upon. It's being watched by corporations that want to aggregate our information and track us, like Facebook, by governments that want to make sure we're doing the right things, like the NSA looking at our phone calls and emails, by criminals that want to bank as us, steal as us, be us. And she taught me a third lesson. She showed a window on something else, which was the source of most of all of this spying. She taught me that it's all about the Benjamins. She taught me that it's all about the Benjamins. Forward, it looks like data. But when you get to know it a little closer, you understand that the data is currency. It's cash. <coughs> and like any currency, the more that you spend, the less you have. The more you protect, the greater you keep. Identity is a form of currency. Data is a form of currency. Rosemary was giving me a gift. It was the gift of humility of respect. I don't know if you're familiar at all with martial arts, but in Taekwondo, in martial arts, you have belts. And the first belt is a white belt. And when you put on that white belt, you learn to have a little bit of humility, or a lot of it. You, you're saying to yourself, listen, I might know how to fight, but I'm not really ready to step on this mat and spar and fight at a level above me. I have humility. 
She gave me, Rosemary gave me, that sense. Unfortunately, I never moved beyond that belt level. I didn't go higher. On August 12th of that same year, there was a knock on my door. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning. Early, my daughters are at my feet. I open the door at home. Standing there is a gentleman. He's dressed in all black, black suit, black tie. He's got that old green bottle polo cologne on, if you can remember the smell of that stuff. So distinctive, and here he's wearing it in 21st century. And he's got a badge. And he tells me that I'm being investigated for the theft of $298,000. Three words popped into my head. Rosemary Flippin Serrano, <laughs> my first thief. But this had nothing to do with the first case of identity theft. Fast forward nine days, I'm sitting in a questioning room. <clears throat> sitting across from me is Agent Brad Wymura from the Economic Crimes Unit, part of the Denver District Attorney's Office. To my left is Jeff Paliuka, the criminal lawyer that took my case for the next two years. Wymura is essentially interrogating me asking me the same aggressive questions over and over again. And in doing that, he's laying out what they think I've done. Here's what he says. 16 months earlier, I set up a new credit card account. I don't know anything about it. And then proceeded to spend $20,000 a month on things like online pornography. I tell you because I want you to know how embarrassing this gets. In order to pay off those bills, I stole from my clients. I embezzled funds out of my own business, stole from my clients, to cover the crimes. Using the checking and routing account numbers off of the bottom of the checks they paid me with, I electronically transferred funds, he says, from their business accounts into my credit card account to pay off that balance. He sets a report in front of me subpoenaed from American Express, proving that those transfers originated not just inside of my office, but on my computer. He shows me my IP address, my username, my password. And as my lawyer, Jeff, is looking at me, like, who are you? Agent Weimer asks me, Mr. Cillian, did it never occur to you that you were leaving a trail of digital footprints all over this crime? Footprints that will land you in jail for eight to 10 years when you're done with this. <coughs> Your privacy is like oxygen. Sometimes you don't even notice it. You don't even miss it until it's already gone. I don't want you to have to be in that room suffocating like I was before you realize it. I don't want you to have to figure out that somebody like me had taken my numbers, used them to spend money as me, to access bank accounts as me, to hurt others as me, and that that someone, as it turns out, was my business partner, Doug. A man that I trusted like my big brother, stole my identity for a second time, set up a credit card account in my name using one of those silly pre-approved credit card offers to fund his sick habits, embezzled from our clients using my login credentials while I was at lunch, and used my identity to cover every one of his crimes. Doug spent more than $300,000 in my name, and I spent the next two years of my life fighting like hell to stay out of jail. Waking up for the middle of the night conversations with Mary, thank God, my wife Mary, who got me through this. What's gonna to happen to our kids when I go to jail? In the process, before it was all over, I lost the family business. My choices, my lack of due diligence, my lack of respect for all of this, lost me that family business. I lost the software company more than $300,000 that my family paid back personally because Doug never paid a dime. And I lost something more central to who I am than that. About 18 months into my criminal trial, I'm sitting downstairs in my home office. I'd go home and I'd spend my nights figuring out how to resurrect everything that I had lost. And my daughter, Sophie, my youngest, uh, sorry, my oldest, five years old, comes downstairs into the basement, it's just before bedtime. Well, I'm working on a criminal case here, trying to keep myself out of jail, and I think she could tell that I was distracted. 
because she was whispering. She was, it was so memorable because she had on her Halloween costume. It wasn't Halloween, but it didn't matter. She had on her Halloween costume, she was carrying her stuffed dog Scrappy right here, and a book called Daddies Are For Catching Fireflies, here. One of those books that epitomizes what it means to be a great dad or a great parent. And she was whispering, Dad, it's story time. Daddy, come upstairs, tell me a bedtime story. Daddy, Sophia, not now. This is so, so important. When you're done, Daddy, can I be so, so important? For two years, I had passed up the chance to catch fireflies with my little girls. Because of the exposure of my data, I gotta tell you, in that moment, I had to ask, who am I? I'd lost track. Victim? Felon? Failure? What? Somehow I could not let that be what defined me from that point on. Who am I? I've always been the keeper of fireflies for my little girls. But I don't want to talk just about me. I want you to ask yourselves, who are you? Think of that. Who are you? Really? At the core, at the heart. <coughs> because that's your identity, not some number. When we begin to understand that who we are is what's at stake, we become more powerful than our opponents, <coughs> than the criminals. Because now we are fighting with a purpose. Thanks to all our friends, we believe we have put together another outstanding event. The 10th Annual Shore Fraud Conference will be held on Friday, November the 21st. The conference will be held in Purdue Hall on the campus of Salisbury University. The conference will be a day-long event from 7 a.m. to 4.45 p.m., providing eight hours of fraud-related, NASBA-approved, continuing professional education for the affordable cost of $135 per person. Your registration includes continental breakfast, an all-you-can-eat luncheon buffet, refreshments throughout the day, and valuable giveaways. On behalf of the conference sponsors, I'm inviting you to be with us on Friday, November the 21st. So don't delay and send your registration in today. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today on PAC 14. For more information, visit our website, Delmarva imanet.org. You can email me at frankfightsfraud at comcast.net or feel free to give me a call at 410-430-0469.